Hey kids, Charlie Buso here. This is the fourth class for gas chemistry. This is the fourth and last one. Let's get through this. Uh, we'll do a couple of problems, got a demo, and then we're gonna finish up the notes. Okay, this is your standard issue question from an old Regents. The Regents always ask a question like this. This is called the ideal gas question. They always ask about a real gas being more ideal. Sometimes they reverse and say, which would be least ideal? But it's the same idea. Now this question says, under what conditions of temperature and pressure does this real gas, carbon dioxide, that's a real gas, behave more like an ideal gas? Now the most important thing is it doesn't become liquid or worse, solid. So how does carbon dioxide stay a gas and not become a liquid? It's gotta be hot because the hotter it is, the more kinetic energy the particles have, the harder they bang, the least likely they are to stick together. So hot and low pressure, because with low pressure, they're moving around, but they're not hitting each other. The less chance of it colliding and sticking and making it a liquid, the more ideal it is. So in this case, and in every case, high temperature and low pressure. Now, if it happened to say to reverse, which conditions would be least ideal? then it will be cold and high pressure because cold would squish them together and high pressure would squish them together and turn them into a liquid. This is most ideal. High temperature, low pressure, hot and loose. Okay, crazy. This is another standard issue, Regents question. I'm looking at the, the demo here. That's what I'm looking off to. I'm looking for the demo, see if it's almost ready. I got something heating up for you. This is, this is standard issue Avogadro's hypothesis question. You could do a whole lot of math on all four of these answers to see if it matches the math in the question. We're not doing any math, use my brain. Which gas sample at standard temperature and pressure has the same number of molecules as two liters of carbon dioxide at standard temperature and pressure? You could do a whole lot of math. You can convert liters into moles and then moles into particles. You could do that five times and see which two match up or you can remember Avogadro's hypothesis. Equal volumes of different gases at the same temperature and pressure have the same number of particles and the same number of moles. So if you got two liters of this gas, two liters of any gas at the same temperature and pressure. Now they said STP, that'll make you think about doing some math, maybe, or maybe it'll confuse you, but it doesn't matter. Standard temperature and pressure but one gas has to have the same conditions for the other gas. It could be any temperature and pressure. Could be STP, but it's gotta be the same. So there you go. So, can crush. All right, so let's look at this. Let's look at this and see what's going on. I got a set up for you right over here. First off, I got a big beaker of water, okay? Big beaker of cold water. Got it right out of my sink. Here, I have an empty seltzer can. Can you see it? Oh, you know what? I think, I apologize. Let me get you off share so you can see it bigger, okay? There we go. It'll be much better for you now. This, this whole technological thing, I'm, I'm not a movie director. You can do this at home. Can you see the steam coming out of this can? It's on a hot plate. Can you see the hot plate? It's on high. It's boiling away. Put a little bit of water in this. You can do this at home on your stove. If you do it on a gas stove or electric stove, medium high heat. You can't, you can't melt the can anyway, but no reason to go overboard. A little bit of water. Now, a little bit of water, there's a lot of air in the can. Can is open, right? Because my name is not Thomas Buckles. I'm not going to explode this can. Too much vapor pressure if you heat it up. As the water boils, the steam comes up up, up, and the whole top of the can fills up with steam, which is a gas. And more steam keeps getting formed at the bottom. So as the steam comes out and pushes up, the can gets full, filled with steam. I'm gonna flip that can over into this cold water and we're gonna watch what happens. Ready? You can do this at home. You could use a glove. Can't get hurt. All right, a little bit of boiling water, you'll be fine. Ready? Look what happened here. Look what happened. Look at this can. Look at my can. It got, it got squashed, right? So I gotta ask you some questions to make sure you understand. We're gonna move back away from this can here. I'll bring it with me. 
See this can? It's smashed. It's gonna be hard to get my nickel back at Wegmans. I slide it into the machine. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to fight with that. So, what the heck's going on here? Let me, let me share my screen again. Get back to uh, where we are. And uh, yeah, I'm sharing screen. So, most important question. When the steam fills up and we flip it upside down and the can is squashed, two, one question, this is what happened? Did the can get sucked in from the inside? Did it, when, when the steam turned to liquid and the, the gas turned into liquid and took up less space, did it suck its way in? Suck the can in? Or did the air pressure squash it from the outside? So what do you think happened? Did the can, when the steam, when the steam turned into a liquid, it took up a certain volume, but as a liquid, it takes up less volume. Did it suck the can in? Or did the air pressure squash it from the outside? Hmm. It's very important you know this. This is, this is always true, and it comes in perfect right now. Chemistry never sucks, ever, right? The can was crushed from the outside. So this is what happens. Oh, look, this, I used a Coca-Cola can in this picture, and that's a microwave. This is not my house. This is obviously a different it's a Google picture because uh, I don't drink Coca-Cola, too much sugar, and I, I don't have a microwave like that. Um, so that's a fake picture, but it's the same idea. Now, let's draw a graph showing temperature as a function of pressure. Temperature as a function of pressure means temperatures on the up and down and pressures across the bottom. The temperature decreases and the pressure decreases too. They're directly proportional. As the temperature goes down, when I put it in the can, take it off the heat, put it in the cold water, the temperature drops, the pressure is going to drop too. It's actually going to phase change. It's going to drop a lot though. They both go in the same direction. They both decrease directly proportional. How do we show directly proportional? We have a straight line that comes out of the corner. Now, that straight line looks like it's almost 45 degrees. That means the temperature and pressure are changing not only in the same direction, but by about the same amount. They're going down at the same amount or up at the same amount. But you can have different angles and still be directly proportional. For instance, um, every time you make a dollar, I make $10. So if you make $2, I make $20. You make $3, I make $30. I'm getting richer faster than you, but we're both getting richer, right? Except you're going slow and I'm going really fast. We're both going in the same direction. So it doesn't have to be exactly 45. It just has to be in a straight line so that they both variables, in this case, temperature and pressure, both either increase together or decrease together. Okay, doke. Now let's look at this formula. This is called the combined gas law. It has all gas chemistry in it in high school regents chem. There's more gas chemistry. You'll see it another day maybe if you go to college. There's other formulas and other cool stuff. Say it once or twice. Combined gas law. P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. It means the original pressure times volume divided by Kelvin temperature is gonna equal the new conditions of pressure times temperature divided by Kelvin temperature. Now there's six letters there, two P's, two V's, and two T's. You always know five of them. Now sometimes there's constants, like if the temperature is constant, you can do some algebra in advance, but you always know all of the variables except one. And that's the one you got to solve for. And you can solve for pressure or temperature or volume. And sometimes the problems can be a pain in the neck. They can say, well, what was the original pressure if this is the new conditions? It doesn't matter which side the equal side's on. It, it all works out the same. Here's the math. The red formula only across the top. P1V1 equals P2V2. This is a multiplication relationship. Pressure times volume, original, equals pressure times volume, new conditions. Temperature's constant, we can cancel it beforehand, right? In order for the multiplications to stay equal, one goes up, one goes down, or one goes down, one goes up. The only way it can stay equal is if one, one P goes up and the V goes down, or reverse. They have to be inversely proportional. They go opposite of each other. Now, in this red formula, volume is constant. And this can happen if you have a canister, like a scuba tank. That canister's going to stay and hold its shape. It doesn't matter what, what, else, what else happens. It's a big, thick piece of metal. It's going to hold its volume. 
Here we say P1 divided by T1 equals P2 divided by T2. Now this relationship, notice this, this is a division relationship. Pressure is divided by temperature equals the new pressure divided by the new temperature. Now multiplication, division. Division, directly proportional. They both go up. If pressure goes up, temperature's gotta go up also. If the temperature goes down, the pressure's gotta go down. They both work in the same direction. Now in this one, pressure is constant. And we end up with V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, another divisional relationship. Volume divided by temperature equals volume divided by temperature too. This is also directly proportional. They're not multiplied, they're divided, like fractions. Okay. Now, the kinetic molecular theory. Now you should make flashcards. Now in the old days, last year, well, last year, yeah, we were still in school last year at this time. You gotta know this, this year, I'm not sure what's going on, you know? I don't know if there's gonna be a regents, I don't know. This is good to be, you should be aware of it. Should you have flashcards? You wanna be smart, you should. You should know the difference between what parts of this theory are actually true and which parts are kind of fuzzy, but help you understand. The kinetic molecular theory is the theory to help explain what is a gas and why does a gas stay a gas and never become a liquid, because liquids are bad, right, if you're a gas. So, this says, number one, gas particles are in random, constant, straight line motion, 100% true. The particles of gas, whether they're atoms or molecules, only move in straight lines. No loops, no curves, no hovering. If they slow down and clump up into a liquid, that's bad. So they, they go exactly in straight lines. If they bump into each other, they go off at angles, okay? Ideal gases and real gas gases follow this exactly. Now, ideal gases is the theory. Real gases are real. Real gases, in this case, all the particles work in straight lines and constant random, they're going in every direction. A little bit of gas takes up the whole room, right? Somebody puts on a little too much perfume in a big room, you can smell it everywhere. Why? Perfume molecules go everywhere. And they get into your nose, no matter where you are. Now, oh, look at this beautiful picture. See those little balls? They represent little gas molecules or gas particles. I don't know what they are. We'll call them helium atoms. Or we could even say that a little blue circle means carbon dioxide, but in a real particle diagram, carbon dioxide would be one circle with two little circles, right? But these particles of gas, if you put them all together, they take up a little bit of room, but the box is really big. The particles are separated by vast distances. All that white space, that's why I run so fast on the ground. I zip between those particles and there's very little friction, right? If I try to run in a swimming pool, the whole thing is filled up with molecules all touch when I try to run, they really hold me back. There's a lot of empty space, right? Ideal gases are not real, but ideal gases and real gases follow this exactly. The, the room is huge, right? But the amount of actual particles, very, very small. Very, very small. All the air in this whole classroom fit in my pocket, no problem, if you squashed it enough. Because there's a lot of room between the particles. Now, I like this cute picture, isn't it? These little round circles are gas particles. <clears throat> They're all... I know, bouncing around, and if they bump into each other, they seem to just bounce off each other. They act like little hard spheres, but this is not true. In theory, that's what we say. In real life, gas molecules have shapes. Some of them are round, I suppose, like you could say a, a, a neon atom, not bonded to anything, it's just one atom. It's, it's more or less round, but really, it's a nucleus with some electrons and most of it is really literally not there. We have a picture of what the atom looks like because we draw it. It looks like it's got some space and shape around it, but it really doesn't. It's very few electrons and, uh, but they act like little hard balls, like, like pool balls. When you blast them into each other, they blast off. But in, in all honesty, bigger molecules, gasoline, propane, methane, well not methane, propane, butane, octane, those molecules are a little big and they can get tangled up and sometimes some of them do, but then they bounce apart when they hit something else. Gases tend to stay gases, but they can in fact get a little tangled up. Ideal gases always, and or well, they always bounce off each other and never get clumped up, but that's fake. Real gases, if you can squish them enough and make them cold enough, they'll tangle up. But they do act like little hard balls. It's a pretty picture, it's like a sunny day. 
The particles act as if there's no attraction or repulsion, but that's, that's outright fib, right? This is not true. All particles have at least a little attraction for other particles, right? We'll talk about that in bonding. What, what are really, what are the intermolecular attractions? There's three or four of them. Um, but it's not very great, right? It's not a great attraction, but there is some. But if there was any attraction or repulsion, some, some molecules actually repel. There's a positive and negative side, and sometimes they're attracted, and if you turn them around, they're more re repelled from each other. Any of that would decrease the total kinetic energy, which would slow the, the gas down and over time would turn the gas into a liquid. Now that should happen, and in real life, it could happen in a closed system. But out here with the earth, even on a cold day with all this snow, I'm, I'm in school, we had two snow days in a row, it's still snowing. Even in a cold day like today, it's cold to you, but outside it's like 260 Kelvin. That's plenty of energy to make the gas stay gas. The sun comes out even on a cold day and gives free energy to the earth. So any attraction and repulsion that uses up some of the kinetic energy by slowing the gases down, the earth warms it up, the, the, the air from, from the atmosphere, from the sun, or even from the earth or from the heat in the room, particles bounce back. The loss of energy is very, very slight. It's real, but gases act like there's no attraction or repulsion because if there was attraction or repulsion, the gas would slow down, turn into a liquid. That doesn't happen. It doesn't. Oh, here's a really cool picture. Look at this one bouncing around. This is crazy time. The collisions between gas particles are said to be elastic, elastic like your socks, right? It means that when gas particles bump into each other, they transfer all of their energy. There's no loss of energy, right? And the average kinetic energy of all the particles you have, the gas stays constant. Now that's not really true. Whenever there's a collision, and, and whenever there's collisions, there's a little bit of heat lost, there's a little bit of sound that you can't hear because your ears are too big, and there is, of course, a loss of energy. But it's very, very slight. And again, the sun comes out every day. The heat comes on and warms the gases back up. The amount of energy they lose to collisions is very, very slight. It's real. It's real, but it's very, very slight. In a closed system, if you took a tank of gas and you buried it in a, in a hole, the molecules would slow down and slow down and slow down. And over time, if it gets warm enough, I'm sorry, if it gets cold enough, it could turn into a liquid. Now, even in the ground, right? It might get down to, I don't know, even if it got down to minus 20 centigrade, to 253 Kelvin, that's enough to keep most gases gases, right? But if it gets colder and colder and colder, there'll be a loss of energy over time. But even in the ground, the earth is gonna provide a certain amount of energy. The gases act like the collisions are elastic. That's a good vocabulary word, elastic collisions, no loss of energy but they do lose some energy in real life. Now, I like this picture too. Two of the gases, the same gas. Picture on the left is low pressure because the container is big. And then if you squash it, you got high pressure. Same number of particles, right? If you're an ideal gas, you're fake, first of all. If you're an ideal gas, you can squish them literally to no volume, which is impossible, but you can squish them and it stays a gas because it's magic. But in reality, you squish a real gas to a certain point, the particles are gonna turn into a liquid. They're gonna be stuck. I mean, no avoiding it. Real gases, all gases, because there's no such thing as ideal, all gases can be compressed so far before they become liquid. Ideal gas, it doesn't matter. Ideal gases can be compressed indefinitely and stay gases. Ideal gases are fake though, right? No matter how hard I try, I screw up as a teacher. I'm not an ideal teacher. Try to be, I'm not. Oh, look at that sad little face on, this, on the left, and there's a happy face. Ready? Kinetic energy is directly proportional to, to the Kelvin temperature. We don't use centigrade. We don't use the F word, Fahrenheit. We use Kelvin because there really is, I suppose, a theoretical zero, but that really means zero. Otherwise, you have a number in the denominator of the combined gas law that's greater than zero, and it's always, great, and it's always a positive number. You can't have negative numbers or, or zero in the denominator of your math. Now, kinetic energy and temperature, directly proportional, right? The hotter it is, the, uh, the temperature's up and the more the particles move, okay? Directly proportional, but we say Kelvin. Kelvin is a good thing to say. Ooh, now we're gonna do some review. We gotta do three graphs 
casually, but correctly. Pressure, volume, and temperature. The first one, volume is a function of temperature. That means volumes on the up and down, temperatures on the bottom. Volume and temperature are directly proportional. Middle one, pressure is a function of volume. Pressure, volume on the bottom, inversely proportional. And the last one, pressure is a function of temperature. Pressure is a function of temperature, directly proportional. So let's look at these graphs. <clears throat> the first one and the third one on the outside, directly proportional means there's a straight line graph. Now it doesn't have to be both about 45. They can be any angle you want. Straight line, as long as both variables increase or decrease, not necessarily at the same rate, but in the same direction. The middle graph is inversely proportional. When pressure goes up, volume goes down. When pressure goes down, the volume goes up. It's hard to draw. See what I wrote on the bottom? It's curvilicious. Kind of reminds me of that Black Eyed Peas singer, Fergie, okay? This one is curvilicious. She has a song called Fergalicious, which I think is hysterical um, as a song. All right, some more old regions questions. According to the KMT, kinetic molecular theory, the particles of an ideal gas have no potential energy. Eh, that's how we just talked about it. That's not in it. Separated by great distances compared to their size. That's probably it. Strong intermolecular force. Nope, they're not attracted at all. There's no attraction or repulsion. Are arranged in a regular repeated geometric pattern. That's a solid. So this is number 62. Deuce, got to be number two. Which temperature change would cause the sample of an ideal gas to double in volume while the pressure is held constant? We want double volume, pressure's constant. So we got to do temperature. Temperature's got to go up double also. So look at this. Temperature goes up from 200 to 400. That's going to double the pressure. And number two there, separated by vast distances compared to their size. All right, more. A sample of gas is combined to a cylinder with a movable piston. That means the volume can change. Constant pressure, constant pressure. So what formula are we gonna use for constant pressure? Let me see if I can write something down. Constant pressure. Hmm, the volume of a gas doubles when the temperature of the gas is changed. So we'll just do this. I'll do 10 liters and we'll double it to 20 liters. And it says the volume of a gas double temperature change from, this is how you gotta think about it. In order to make the volume go from 10 to 20 liters to double it, the temperature's got to go from whatever temperature it is to twice that. We got to make it twice as hot. So it's got to get double hot and it's got to be in Kelvin. So it has to be number two, 200 to 400 K. Under which conditions, number 65, of temperature and pressure would a one liter sample behave most like an ideal gas? To be ideal, you have to be hot, temperature, and low pressure. So which one of these has the hottest temperature and the lowest pressure? So it's gotta be 500K and it's gotta be the lowest pressure there, three. Look at that. Double the Kelvin temperature and hottest with lowest pressure. This stuff is easy. E-A-S-Y. Easy. I like this graph. This is hard to draw this graph on a computer. It's a little more curvilicious in real life, but you get the idea. What could this be, A and B? It could be pressure as a function of volume, pressure as a function of temperature, volume as a function of temperature, or kinetic energy, I'm sorry, temperature as a function of kinetic energy. Inversely proportional, pressure volume. It has to be pressure as a function of volume. The other ones are all directly proportional. This is the only one that's inversely proportional. <clears throat> What's the volume of a gas? Two atmospheres, 360K. If the original volume is 307 liters, what is the volume? So, oh, this is one of those backwards questions. They give you the, the answer. P1, V1 over T1. 
So we're looking at the combined gas law. What is the volume of gas that up? If its original volume was 0 0.250 atmospheres and 307 liters, and the original temperature was 385 Kelvin, and that's going to be 2.00 atmospheres. Wow, higher pressure than original. And V2 is the unknown. What is the volume? And the temperature changes. So let's see what we got. What is the volume of a gas at two atmospheres in 360K if this was the original? Holding this up for you is crazy. So, it started out at 0.25 atmospheres. Oops, there's a little boo-boo there, kids. Do you see that? Uh-oh, what happened? I lost my slideshow. This has to be ATM for atmospheres. I'll hit save. And let me go back to my Zoom, hang in there. We're gonna share screen again, right here. Sorry for the boo-boo. And you'll see it again in just a second. Slideshow from current slide. 0.25 atmospheres, 307 liters, 385 Kelvin. And uh, that's what I got. Two atmospheres, V2 divided by 360. We're gonna cross multiply. And we're gonna get V2 by itself and it turns out to this math. You should be able to do this math by now. Three significant figures. Under which conditions, temperature and pressure would a one liter sample of real gas be least ideal? Least, this is from the regions. Remember I told you it's always the ideal gas question, but sometimes it's in reverse, least ideal. We wrote this down before. Most ideal would be hot with low pressure. So let me see what I got here least ideal would be cold and high pressure. You wanna actually write stuff like this down so you can figure it out easily. So we're looking for the coldest temperature. So the coldest temperature here looks like 3.356 Kelvin. And we're looking for highest pressure. So the answer has to be two. Least ideal. There's a mistake. Who makes these slideshows? You know what? I think I make these by mistake sometimes on purpose, just to show you that it's just fun to make mistakes. I'm not a perfect guy. I want to be the ideal teacher, but I'm not, I'm not an ideal teacher. I'm a real teacher, I make boo-boos, that's the answer. It's gotta be the coldest and the highest pressure. My goodness. Now in real life, if you were just in class with me, like you would be normally, you know, I would show you this slide and I'd cross things out and the answers, I used to put this answer slide up just for the kids. I used to say, ah, in case they're home. Now you're all home. Now it's all remote. There's so much weird stuff going on. These mistakes, I wouldn't even see them because I would do the work with you and then we wouldn't even look at this slide. Oh my goodness. When we celebrate gases, which is coming, this is how you have to do well. You have to be able to write out and explain the kinetic molecular theory. There's seven or eight parts, right? Gases are made of hard round spheres, travel in straight lines, there's no, there's no elastic collisions, there's no repulsion or attraction, blah, blah, blah. You gotta draw these three graphs. Pressure and volume, inverse. Pressure and temperature, directly. And volume and temperature, also directly. Avogadro's hypothesis, equal volumes, different gases at the same temperature and pressure, have the same number of particles, the same number of moles. You'll be able to calculate any pressure conversions. That means going from atmospheres to kilopascals to millimeters of mercury to PSI. You wrote that all 
on your reference table right underneath table A. You'll be able to calculate any type of combined gas law problem. That means using the uh, combined gas law or constant temperature, constant pressure, or constant volume, or any combinations of those. You tell the difference between a real and ideal gas. A real gas is real. Ideal gas is, is like the ideal teacher. It doesn't exist. Ideal gases help explain what gases are, but they're not real. And you have to read the basics two times. T-W-O-2-2-2, okay? We may have a celebration on this. I may just do an open book celebration, and I'll just have to see if you guys, you know, I'll just say, please don't cheat. Don't waste my time. You know, this is the deal. If you cheat, you get a good grade. Probably, unless you cheat from somebody who's dopier than you and you copy all the wrong stuff. But I don't want to go to all the work of grading something if it's fake. If it's fake, I'll just give you 100. If you're going to cheat, just say, look, I'm going to cheat anyway. Give me 100. I don't want to waste my time grading your paper. I'm going to count on you. We'll, we'll probably celebrate this because it'll be three or four questions. Just do your own work. You want to be a good person. You know what a character is? Character is what you do when nobody else is looking. And if you cheat, you have a low character. You have, you have weak character. You're not going to be the person you want to be when you grow up. When you grow up, you want to have a good character. You want to be a good, strong person, do the right thing. You find yourself a nice person to be in love with. They have good character and you have a good life together. If you marry somebody with low character, somebody who's going to do bad things behind your back, waste your money, take drugs, cheat and steal and whatever, you're not going to be happy. You got to have good character. You have to do the right thing, even when nobody else is looking. Okay? It's the most important thing in the world. Be a good person. Right? That's, that's all it is. Right? Be a good person. Learn chemistry. Be a good person. Go shovel the driveway for your parents because it's been snowing and you've probably been hanging out on the couch playing with your thumbs. Get up, go out, shovel the snow, walk the dog, take the garbage out, do the dishes or put them away. Do something. Be a good person. Show that you have good character, that they have grown you up right. And even if they haven't grown you up too right, I didn't have a good, good father. I had a good mother. I still tried to do the right thing, right? Still tried to do the right thing, most important. Now that I'm a father and a husband and a teacher, I try my best to be ideal. I don't always succeed. Okay, I think that was the last slide. We're done. All right, I'm back to full size. Woo, woo. We're done with gas chem. I don't like being in the room without you guys. I don't have to shave, and I don't have to wear a mask, but I miss you guys. All right, see ya.